On this Tuesday's early edition at 6, North Korea makes yet another statement by firing off multiple short-range rockets into the East Sea this afternoon, the third such launch in about a week. South Korea's foreign minister gears up for an address to the UN Human Rights Council where he is set to convey Korea's stance on Japan's past use of sex slaves. A possible de-escalation of tensions in Ukraine where Russian President Vladimir Putin has ordered forces engaged in military exercises near the Ukrainian border back to their bases. We have these stories and more coming up. It is 4 a.m. in Washington, 11 in Kiev, and 6 on a Tuesday evening here in Seoul. Good evening to you all. Welcome to Early Edition at 6. I'm Lim Gwon Young. I'm Daniel Che. Thank you for joining us. We begin some more provocations coming from North Korea. Right. It is the latest in a string of provocations in recent days. North Korea fired off multiple short-range rockets into the East Sea earlier this afternoon. For more, let's go live to our Yurian on the line. Lian, uh, what do we know so far? Hi guys, starting at around 4.30 this afternoon, North Korea fired four short-range projectiles using a multiple rocket launcher into the East Sea. Now this according to Seoul's Defense Ministry. These missiles have a range of about 155 kilometers. Now given that we have been receiving reports of additional launches within the hour, the number could very well go up in the coming hours. Now immediately following reports of these short-range projectile launches, we were also notified that North Korea had already already fired three short-range missiles into the East Sea earlier this morning, bringing the total of missiles launched just today to seven. The ones fired in the morning flew about 55 kilometers in a northeasterly direction. These launches are, of course, the latest in a series of provocations by Pyongyang. As you guys may remember, Pyongyang fired four short-range missiles into its eastern waters last Thursday, a move that was seemingly in protest of the ongoing joint South Korea-U.S. military drills. And then yesterday morning, Pyongyang fired two more Scud C short range missiles into the East Sea. And the latest, of course, are the seven fired today. And we won't be surprised to have more news of such stories. Now, any idea of the reason behind the sudden increase in the number of missiles and rocket launches, Leon? Well, it's all speculation at this point, but North Korea did call out the United States earlier today for deploying its nuclear-powered submarine for the ongoing joint military drills with South Korea, calling it a provocation for a nuclear war against the communist country. The USS Columbus arrived in Korea's southernmost port city of Busan on Monday, along with U.S. command ships to participate in the annual drill. Now, calling the move an overt threat, North Korea's main internet-based propaganda website, Uri Minjokiri, called the move part of concrete steps to invade the North. So harsh words coming from North Korea in regards to joint military drills and then the firing of these multiple ballistic missiles and projectiles. Experts have repeatedly linked the launches to North Korea's protests against the military drills, and the launch today seem to be in line with that as well. All right, thank you, Leon, for that. That was our UDN on the latest provocation by the North, and we will have updates for you in our later newscasts. Meanwhile, the reunions of families separated by the Korean War last month highlighted the fact that while a select few were granted the opportunity to meet with their long-lost loved ones, there are roughly 71,000 South Koreans still waiting for that same chance. President Park Geun-hye on Tuesday called for all-out efforts to make sure they get it. Our presidential correspondent, Choi Yoo-sun, reports. Just days after proposing to North Korea that reunions for war-separated families be held on a regular basis, 
President Bakune called for other ways for the family members on both sides of the border to resume contact. 통일부와 대한 적집사사는 상봉 정례화는 물론이고 생사 확인과 서신 교환, 화상 상봉 등을 실현시키기 위해 북한과 협의하기를 바랍니다. At Tuesday's cabinet meeting, the South Korean leader highlighted the urgency of holding more of the humanitarian events. 남북한에 있는 많은 이산 가족들이 한을 안고 돌아가셨는데 생존에 계신 이산 가족들이 한 번이라도 헤어진 가족들을 만나려면 상봉 규모를 매년 6천 명 이상으로 늘려야 하는 것으로 압니다. The president's remarks come less than two weeks after the two Koreas held their first reunion event in more than three years. Some 80 family members from each side attended last month's family gatherings. President Bak then said the government's new preparatory committee for reunification should initially listen to public opinion on the issue and draw up a blueprint in an open and transparent way. Choi yoo Arirang News. Seoul's foreign minister will raise the issue of sexual slavery by the Japanese military during the Second World War at the United Nations Human Rights Council this week amid denials by Tokyo about its wartime atrocities. Our Kim ji reports. South Korean Foreign Minister Yoon Byung-se will address the UN Human Rights Council this week to raise the issue of the so-called comfort women, or women forced into sexual slavery by the Japanese military during World War II. Seoul's Foreign Ministry said Tuesday Minister Yoon will give a speech in Geneva on Wednesday local time to convey the country's stance on the human rights issue. This is the first time since 2006 Seoul's top diplomat will attend a UN Human Rights Council session. Minister Yoon is expected to call on Japan to compensate the victims of its wartime program of military sexual slavery. The move comes amid Tokyo's continued denials of its past wrongdoing. Japanese media outlets recently quoted Japan's senior vice minister of education, Yoshitaka Sakurada, as saying that a 1993 apology for the sexual slavery system was fabricated while calling for a re-examination of the supporting testimony. The Kono statement is an official apology issued by Tokyo's then chief cabinet secretary, Yohei Kono, to apologize for the atrocities Japan committed committed during its imperilous past. Tokyo's right-wing Liberal Democratic Party said those who were foreign ministry officials at the time should be summoned regarding the testimony. The LDP also said it will start a petition to call for a revision of the statement. Kim ji Arirang News. As South Korea prepares for the reunification of the Korean Peninsula, it is looking to Germany for lessons on bringing a divided nation together. Our Hwang sang hee sat down with the German economist Karl-Heinz Pake for his view on the steps Seoul should take. German economist Karl-Heinz Pake, who is an expert on German unification, says giving North Koreans a clear economic perspective is key in preparing for the reunification of the Korean Peninsula. Because if they don't have that perspective, they're going to mass migrate to the south. You know, Seoul is a city of 20 million, the whole metropolitan area of 20 million people, a thriving economy. So once the border is open, North Koreans will, be, uh, will, will come in great numbers. In an interview with Arirang News on Tuesday, Pake said the Koreas must begin by forming a currency union and transforming and privatizing the rundown North Korean industrial sector. This process cost Germany over 2 trillion U.S. dollars. Although there are varying estimates, it's expected to cost Korea around three and a half trillion dollars. But Pake assures it will be money well spent. First of all, North, uh, North Korea <coughs> has uh, quite a supply of raw materials. So it was, uh, uh, you know, historically seen, it was the more industrialized part of the two countries uh, when, when the country was still united. Uh, and uh, with all the trade links that South Korea has to Europe and America, I think there are all advantages you can think of to invest in uh, North, Northern Korea. But the outlook is not all rosy. With a reduced threat of war upon reunification of the two Koreas, there is the question of what will happen to the thousands of North Korean soldiers who represent nearly 40 percent of the population.
you will have high unemployment for a while. We did have very high unemployment in Eastern Germany for a very long time and still the unemployment rate in Eastern Germany is higher than in Western Germany, even today. But uh, that's the price to be paid. Um, uh, and uh, um, the faster you get uh, industry growing again in the north, the more and more easily you can integrate these people. Pake says Germany experienced structural difficulties and suffered from low growth rates for a while. But despite the struggles, he agrees with South Korean President Park Geun-hye that a reunified Korea would have benefits for both sides. So in your view, do you think reunification would be a bonanza for the two Koreas? But we did have, as a consequence of unification, some major economic reforms. And today, Germany is one of the leading, uh, uh, the, the stability anchor uh, in Europe. So the whole venture has been successful. And I would exa expect exactly the same in the case of Korea. Hwang sang Arirang News. Digging deeper, getting to the bottom of stories that impact your life. Talking with you on air and online. Connecting you with experts on the world's most pressing issues. News and current affairs at its best with Moon Gon Yong and Daniel Che on Early Edition at 6. With the world setting the table for economic and diplomatic sanctions on Russia over its military intervention in Ukraine, Moscow has recalled troops taking part in military drills near the border. Our Kim Hyun-bin reports. President Putin has ordered troops taking part in military exercises near the Ukraine border to return to their bases within 48 hours. Presidential spokesman Dmitry Peskov made an announcement Tuesday calling the exercises a success. The surprise military drills in the Central and Western Territorial Commands were launched last Wednesday as tensions rose in Ukraine. They involved over 150,000 troops. The withdrawal comes after the European Union condemned the drills as an aggression and threatened Russia with sanctions if the troops did not return to their bases by Thursday. While the order will be welcomed by the West, U.S. President Barack Obama on Monday said Russia had already violated international laws with his military intervention in Ukraine. I think the world is largely united in recognizing that the steps Russia has taken uh, are a violation of Ukraine's sovereignty, uh, uh, Ukraine's territorial integrity. While Obama stressed the importance of de-escalating the situation, he also warned that the U.S. had been examining a series of economic and diplomatic sanctions that would isolate Russia. Following the president's remarks, the U.S. Trade Representative announced late Monday that it has suspended upcoming bilateral trade and investment talks with Moscow. There's also the issue of Crimea. Ukraine claims that some 16,000 Russian troops have been deployed on that Crimean peninsula since last week. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. The turmoil in Ukraine is spooking global financial markets, unsettling investors already nervous about shaky emerging market economies. Russia's stock market and currency tumbled to levels unseen in recent years, ragging down markets around the globe. Our Song ji reports. Western leaders are threatening Russian President Vladimir Putin with economic penalties for his military intervention in Crimea, but the financial system already appears to be punishing him. The Moscow stock market suffered its biggest plunge in five years on Monday, with the benchmark MySex losing 11 percent before recouping some of its losses in early Tuesday trading. The ruble also hit a new low on Monday, and Russia's central bank tried to contain the plunge by raising its key interest rate by one and a half percentage point to 7 percent. It was the largest interest rate hike since the global financial crisis in 1998. Stocks in global markets stumbled across the board, with investors selling off shares, particularly in companies with exposure to Ukraine and Russia. The Dow Jones Industrial Average shed nearly 1 percent on Monday. But the European markets brought in harder, with the London benchmark Financial Times stock exchange ending day 1.5 percent lower, and Paris and Frankfurt stocks losing 2.7 and 3.4 percent, respectively. Stocks on the Ukraine exchange in Kiev fell about 12 percent, and the country's currency fell to a new low against the U.S. dollar. Ukraine faces a possible default on its debt 
as Moscow is cutting off aid to its limping economy. In Asian markets, Seoul shares closed slightly lower on Tuesday after shedding nearly 1 percent on Monday, while Tokyo and Hong Kong shares rebounded on bargain hunting after losing more than 1 percent each on Monday. The uncertainties pushed oil prices higher, with Brent crude futures adding nearly 2 percent in London, and gold also gained over 2 percent to $1,350 an ounce to mark its biggest gain of the year. Song Ji-sun, Arirang News. The suicide of a six-year-old mother and her two adult daughters due to financial problems got the attention of President Park Geun-hye on Tuesday, who said the incident should open the government's eyes to welfare reform. Speaking at a cabinet meeting on Tuesday, President Park urged lawmakers to strengthen uh, the government's reform and the uh, and the government's welfare policies. Now, it urged lawmakers to strengthen welfare policies, noting that. Had the victims signed up for national basic living support, the government could have helped them. A six-year-old woman and her two daughters committed late suicide late last month because they were having a hard time making ends meet. Now, if the family had registered for emergency aid, they would have gotten about 840 U.S. dollars a month, but they did not know that they had qualified. Moving on to other stories, independent lawmaker An Ter Su is taking heat from all sides after announcing that his fledgling party would merge with the main opposition camp. And the ruling Henry Party has been one of the first to unleash its criticism. Our National Assembly correspondent Jim Young Gil has more. The ruling's Henry Party is taking aim at entrepreneur turned lawmaker An Ter Su, whose surprise merger with the main opposition Democratic Party has changed the political landscape in Korea. Chen Nuri says that An's true colors have been revealed, and on Tuesday, this Henry Floor leader lashed out. I wonder if Representative An feels at all apologetic toward his dumbfounded supporters. He has broken his promise to create a new politics, which he emphasized as the only viable alternative to the politics of the establishment. Members of the Democratic Party who were working with Ann on his new political vision party were quick to come to Ann's defense. It is highly regrettable that the Senri Party continues to speak slanderous words about forming a new opposition coalition. We are here to provide politics for the people and for the country. We urge them to stop disparaging us. The merger is widely being seen as a result of the sense of crisis felt by two liberal parties ahead of local elections on June 4th. The elections represented a major challenge for the opposition bloc, which will likely have seen liberal voters split between the DP and Ann's party, giving Senri an advantage. But more than anything, it has raised questions about Ann's leadership, especially because he has retreated from election campaigns in the past. The two sides are now expected to go through the difficult task of shaping the new party's platform. But there are also concerns on both sides. Some DP lawmakers have said the merger is unwise, while Ann's aides have expressed concern about how many candidates each party will be allowed to field in the June elections. The DP has little to lose in the deal, as the party needs fresh blood to improve its standing from the public, and, however, is at risk of being absorbed by the larger main opposition party. Kim Young-gil, Arirang News. Now, 1.02 quadrillion won, or roughly 954 billion U.S. dollars, that's how much Korean households owed in debt as of the end of last year. Household debt has been a persistent problem for Asia's fourth largest economy, and it's feared that it may hurt domestic demand. And to tackle the country's vexing household debt problem, the Korean government has made it a major focus of its three-year economic innovation plan. 
For a closer look, we're joined live in the studio by Dr. Oh jung Gun, Director of the Asia Finance Society and former Professor of Economics at Korea University. Good to see you again, Doctor. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Now, first, uh, let's take a look at this uh, uh, 1.02 quadrillion won. Now, to me, it's an astronomical figure. I mean, uh, exactly what is the reason behind this such a record high uh, household debt for Koreans, and um, how serious is this? Uh, there might be uh, two causes of the, uh, this uh, heavy uh, household debt. Uh, one is uh, uh, skyrocketing uh, uh, rental cost in Korea. In Korea, we have a specific uh, unique uh, rental system, uh, so-called uh, uh, lump sum uh, deposit system in Korean uh, jeonsae. So the, uh, in recently, during the last five years, uh, uh, the amount of uh, lump sum uh, deposit has increased uh, continuously. Therefore, uh, many tenants uh, uh, have uh, no choice but uh, borrow money from bank. And also, second co uh, cause is uh, uh, increasing the living cost uh, beca uh, because of the during the last about uh, uh, three years, in particular since uh, 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 2008 the financial crisis, uh, Korean economy has declined so much. Therefore, uh, many uh, households' uh, uh, job situation has become unstable so much. Therefore, uh, they must uh, uh, borrow money for financing their living cost. Uh, so due to these uh, two uh, regions, uh, household debt has, has skyrocketed uh, to uh, more than 1,000 trillion won. Okay, now speaking of some possible solutions, the government did unveil some measures to tackle this very problem. Uh, could you perhaps point out some of the key points? Yeah, main key point of government measure uh, they have two points. Uh, one is uh, to improve the structural soundness of the household debt. That is the, uh, to uh, transform the, from the short-term uh, monthly interest pay only uh, mortgage system to long-term uh, fixed, ra fixed rate uh, in monthly installment uh, mortgage rate system. And also the uh, secondary uh, to reduce uh, interest burden to, in particular to lower income household. There is a, uh, with a, such a two measures, uh, government are planned to improve, uh, to improve the uh, soundness of the household there. Now, do these measures, um, are they aimed at slowing down the expansion of the household debt? Well, I think the uh, currently, the debt to income ratio has increased to up to about uh, more than 160 percent. This is much higher than even American ones, which was the cause of the global uh, financial crisis in 2008. At that time, uh, in America, uh, debt to income ratio wa was uh, only 143. Now, Korea is uh, 160, more than 60. Therefore, uh, government think we must reduce uh, uh, this ratio. So, I think, uh, so uh, recently, government uh, uh, announced uh, to reduce this ratio by 5 percent point. Uh, until the end of 2017. So I think uh, uh, even though, uh, even though the, uh, this plan will be achieved, uh, still I think the debt-to-income ratio will be very high uh, in, in Korea. So how to, how to reduce uh, 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 this uh, ratio is a very important issue. So uh, the government's main purpose is uh, uh, to escape from hard lending of household debt, so to how to induce uh, uh, soft lending rather than uh, hard lending in household debt. There are two major criticisms on the government's new plans. One is that uh, some of them seem to be regurgitated or just a, a new cut of paint on some old, um, old ways or, or measures they used to have. And the other is that it's not really practical. What's your take oh, on yeah. that? I think there might be some uncertainty on whether uh, Householders will change uh, their household debt from short-term uh, floating rate, uh, interest payment only, to long-term uh, monthly installment payment system. Because of the uh, still many Korean households, in particular low-income bracket households, has not much sufficient income to repay monthly installment. Therefore, they have cho chosen uh, interest payment, uh, payment only system. Therefore, uh, of course, uh, there might be some tax incentive, uh, but still with a small tax in incentive, uh, there might be a uh, lot of uncertainty whether uh, households will change their uh, household debt structure uh, toward uh, uh, which 
government uh, wants. Eh? All right, Dr. Oh jung -gun, Director of the Asia Finance Society, thank you so much for speaking with us this evening. Yeah, thank you. Let's now get a check on the forecast with our Michelle Park at the Weather Center, and we're going to connect with her. And Michelle, uh, it was a cloudy and uh, warm here in Seoul today, but uh, it seems like uh, the heavy smog that was blanketing the entire nation has really uh, stuck in. That's right, Kanyang. That's because the level of the fine dust has risen once again, but don't worry as the conditions are expected to clear up tonight. Always good to know that we don't have to carry a mask candy. So how's the weather shaping up tomorrow? We can expect another warm day tomorrow with highs of up to 12 degrees, although rain is in the forecast for some regions. Also, heavy snowfall is expected in the East Coast regions and the mountainous areas of Jeju Island. However, after all this rain and the snow, we are going to get a cold snap on Thursday and Friday. Now, going over to our readings, Seoul drops down to minus 1 degrees more in the morning and gets up to 6 in the afternoon. Meanwhile, the southern cities such as Daegu and Busan will get up to 11 and 12 degrees respectively. Down onto Jeju Island, it's going to be cloudy day, hitting up to 7 degrees. Tokto makes it up to 4 and Mount Kumgang drops down to 1. Well, that's all for now. I'm Michelle Park and back to you guys. Thank you for that, Michelle. And that brings us to the end of our newscast. Thank you for watching. This has been Daniel Chen. And I'm Moon Gonyang. Thank you as always for being here with us. Have a wonderful rest of the evening and we'll see you right back here same time tomorrow. Good night.